Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Warner Hodges. He's going to share a great story about meeting Angus Young. We did, the Scorchers went to Australia, 85, 86. Jason and I were allowed to host, it was back in the days when MTV actually played music videos. We both got to host an hour on Australian MTV, and they got upset with me because I played an hour of ACDC videos. I didn't play anything else. <laughs> it was a, um, I play guitar because of those guys. Um, I kept saying every commercial break, the only reason I'm in Australia is I want to meet the ACDC guys. And the tour manager that the record company had hired for us was, I guess, a, a pretty big time guy. And he somehow had found out through the network, supposedly ACDC wasn't even in the country. Cut to my birthday, I guess it was 87. I walk in a dressing room and I look over and I literally do the double take. And I look over again, it's like, damn, that's Angus Young sitting there, you know. Angus is sitting in our dressing room with his wife, you know. And he had, he, I hear you want to meet me, mate, you know. <laughs> so he actually hung out all through sound check. Stayed for the show. We asked him to play with us. He he politely refused. I don't know that he knew any of the tunes anyway, but we'd have come up with something. But he stayed for the whole show. You know, everybody had said, he had told me, we'll probably leave early. We have to rehearse tomorrow at 7 a.m. Those guys would get their kids off to school and rehearse at 7 a.m. You know, can't imagine that volume at 7 a.m., but... He stayed for the whole show. It was wonderful, you know. So that was the beginning of meeting them. I'd seen them probably at that point 40, 50 times. I mean, they're they're my favorite band, you know. That was in Sydney, I think. I'm not sure. It might have been Melbourne. I'm not sure. Uh, that night became a big blur. You know, I've got a picture somewhere, a Polaroid of Angus and I. I'm sitting on a stool. He's standing beside me, and I'm still four or five inches taller. <laughs> <laughs> got to love that stuff, man. But the guy is, you know, uh, Angus and Mal, to me, that's rock and roll guitar 101 and 102. You know, those two sounds, Mal and Angus together, the only two things I've ever seen come close to that was Rick Richards and Dan Baird in the early satellite days. That was just two guitars doing two different things that would tear your head off, you know? And it was like, sign me up. I'm in. You know, I also walked in. It was back when I still drank. Classic Australian story. I walk in a bar, order a beer. Guy walks up to me and takes a swing at me. Not high, how you doing, <laughs> nothing. Takes a swing at me. <laughs> When it went, as soon as I opened his mouth, he was like, oh, mate, sorry. Thought you were someone else. You know, it was, but it, I mean, just like, wow, dude, nice to meet you too, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Owsley, tech that used to work for the Scorchers, started out working for the Scorchers, but he, professional guitar tech. I mean, he's worked for Pearl Jam. He's worked for Neil Young. He's worked some with the Dead. Uh, last real gig he had was working for the Heart Girls. I think Jeff's literally retired from the business now because he could. But Jeff and I are ACDC fanatics, and Jeff knows every tech on the planet. And he just called me up. He got tickets and backstage passes and all that for the makeup show in Atlanta after Brian had had to leave the band for the hearing problem. I'm like, cool, man, I'll meet you in Atlanta. Jeff flies up, I drive down. We go to the show, and Jeff knows both guitar techs. The guy that's teching for Mal, and uh, I think his name's Trace, the guy that's teching for Angus. Hey, you want to go back and look at the gear? Hell yes, I want to go look <laughs> at the gear, you know? So we get to go back and get the... Uh, Reverb had just did the gear... Uh, you know, their video of all the gear, you know. And it's funny because Trace is talking about, this is the small indoor rig, 2,600-watt Marshall heads, every one of them on, the small indoor rig. You know? <laughs> it's not the outdoor rig. This is the indoor rig. But um, we get to go through all the stuff the guy's telling us all about it. I mean, it was fantastic. It was like our own personal reverb guided tour by the tech. What I found funny was 
Angus had three guitars out. You know, well, he had the Back in Black SG, one other SG, and a, his signature model. They had, I've never seen this before, the guitar boat had a padlock thing on it. Trace was like, if, if I leave, people will, will play the guitars, so I have to lock them in the boat where people can't get them out, you know. But he only had three guitars. You see all these guys with nine million guitars. Angus had three guitars, you know, for a two-and-a-half-hour show. And Trace said he'll play the, the back and black guitar the entire I'll have to fight him to get it out of his hand one time to tune it. He'll want it back as quickly as he hands it to me, which is exactly what happened, you know. <laughs> Cliff, their bass player, had two basses. Two basses, you know. Cut to Stevie, their nephew, who's replaced Mal. You know, rest his soul, Mal's gone. Stevie has like 17 guitars over there. He's got a bunch, of, you know, he's like, Stevie's playing rock star, you know. He's still only going to play one guitar, most likely, but he had a lot of stuff. And what was really interesting about the rig, they, they cut to uh, Mal's rig. Stevie actually has everything of Mal's out except the main guitar, the Beast. He plays Mal's backup, the number two guitar. But his amp rig is based on Mal's, 100 watt super bass it's like a 67 or something you know angus's stuff is all reissue stuff from 87 um, they had i think trace said 72 marshall heads out they run them too hot they had two guys that work for marshall travel with them and just rebuild what they blew up last night every day they just set up a shop <laughs> i mean it's like dude where can i sign up for this gig you know i mean it's fantastic they carried a washer and a dryer because they were tired of trying to find places for Angus to get the schoolboy uniform uh, cleaned. So they just carry a washer and dryer with them and load it in and out every day. It's like, all right, I kind of get it, you know. I was fantastic. It's just, I, I, well, I mean, once again, I'm a 15 year old kid in a candy store on that kind of stuff. No, no, no. We were in, we had seats. It was actually great. We went out to our seats and I had to ask Steven Tyler to get out of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> It was great. You know, we're going to sit down that we had great seats. I mean, they were great seats, but it was like, wow, man, is Steven Tyler sitting in my seat? He was, And he was totally cool about it. He, he had no problem moving, you know, but it was just like, yeah, okay, Steven Tyler's sitting in my seat. That's good. Yeah. Oh, it was fantastic. I wanted to be out front for the show. I didn't want to be on the side. Side of stage is cool to watch, but, man, out front's where it's at in an ACDC show. I didn't know what Trace was saying. You know, there can't be any dead spots, and Angus will not wear in-ears. So, you know, and there's mon like the ego ramp thing. There's monitors out there. There can't be any dead spots. He's got to be able to hear what he's doing. I get it. You know, as a guitar player, I get it. But, you know, I was like, well, how, how many of these cabinets are dummies? He said, none of them. Every one of them is on. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow. And the drummer, Chris Slade, which I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a Phil Rudd guy. I'm not a big Chris Slade guy, but... Chris Slade had two four by he had a Malcolm and an Angus four by twelve as monitors. You know, it's like, wow, dude, you need to hear it that bad too. You know, <laughs> it was pretty cool. And I have to say, not a big Axel Axel fan, just not my cup of tea vocally. He did an ungodly job. I thought he was amazing. They were back in standard tuning. They weren't tuned down any, which they were having to do to try to help Brian out some. They played like 27, 28 songs, which they had got to where every 15 minutes there was another five-minute uh, jerk-off guitar solo because they had to. Angus did like one little solo. It was just song after song. It was wonderful. A lot of stuff I haven't heard in years, you know, which was great. I, I, was, I personally thought it was not going to be a great show. I went in with bad expectations and left going, wow, fantastic. And it was also very apparent. Angus was also sick as a dog that night. You'd have never known it. Had the flu. You'd have never known he was sick. And I left that night going, you know what? He ain't done. He he still got some gas in the tank. You know, the last time I, the time before I'd seen him, it was like, wow, Angus is getting old. You know, nah. You know, it's he ain't, he ain't done. I, and I hope he still. I hope he does some more. I love the Power Up record that they put out during COVID. I got it. You know, it's, it's a great record, you know. And the fact that they just threw it out there was like, all right, here, you know. In the middle of COVID, it was the only sunshine I got, you know. 
I'm absolutely in. And if Angus was sitting here, he, he, his influences are Chuck Berry. There it is. And Mal. Chuck Berry and Mal, my brother. <laughs> all right, next. <laughs> you know, it's like, all right, cool. You know, he, his older brothers, George from the Easy Beats and Mal, obviously were feeding him the right records. I mean, because you think about, you go back to the old ACDC, the original stuff. And he, you know, sonically, of course, it got better. You know, they had more money. It got better. But note selection, he was on point at 15, 15 years old. He was on point, you know. Kind of like the Skinner guys, you know, Alan Collins and Freebird. He was on point at that at that point. Whether you like them or not, wish you'd have done that one, you know. 